The Elif Frazier fight is a seminal moment in our script. It changes the tides of all of the dramatics in our film. So the power shifts when we this Ali Frazier fight occurs. It has to give it give a sense of its global importance. So it has to look real. And so I think he must have dressed at least a thousand extras there and then filled out the stadium. We were recreating the uh, Frazier Ali fight and it's uh, 1971 so we were hired to put 1,500 inflatable mannequins to work as the, to intermingle with the real extras in the background of the fight scene. We came in and we set up uh, over three days, a crew of six of us, and uh, come in, we inflate them, we dress them, and uh, move them into the seats and add the faces and the uh, hats and wings. There are 14 different faces, and we don't really do ethnicity as much as we do skin tone. So the dolls themselves, there are multiple uh, skin tones, different shoulder slopes, different heights, and then they're all unisex until they're dressed, and they're dressed to be accessorized as uh, men or women. Each face is hand-painted, so some of the details vary. Some of the skin tones vary so that none actually looks identical to the other one, and that helps to eliminate um, patterning you might see in an audience full of fake people. We know we have 1,500 uh, bodies to work with, and we look at where they're going to set up initially at the beginning of the day, and we try and fit it in at the appropriate ratio for what's going to look good on camera. Knowing that they have 650 real people, that kind of gives us an idea as to how many seats we actually want to fill in each section, so that when they blend it all together, it becomes seamless, and it gives the illusion of filling a place that's um, much larger and has a greater seating capacity than we actually have uh, real people and, and inflatables. We actually didn't move any of the inflatables in until yesterday and we just do all of the prep work kind of out of sight uh, where then when we move everything in we move it in in uh, a massive uh, migration from our holding area into the uh, stadium. And we do this, we do it a lot so we've become familiar with the best way to do it and usually that's because 1,500 uh, inflatable mannequins is a lot of bodies and we take up a lot of space and there's a lot of people who need to do work and if we try and do it anywhere closer to the set, we usually get in everybody's way. So we hide ourselves away until we're ready to come in and then we come in the, the big. had to dress all these actors, he had to have look-alikes because Sammy Davis Jr. was there, Frank Sinatra was there, Joe Lewis was there, and really found a creative way to approach those characters that we know. And he had dressed them and had to cast every single one of these people so that they would conform to the way he perceived that they should perform as kind of cameos that would give this the fabric of this fight its highest level of authenticity. We do our open calls, we advertise in, in Backstage and Showbiz, the weekly publications here in New York. Um, we did Craigslist for a short while, but then, you know what I mean, what we were looking for specifically, and there's a thing called Breakdown Services, so word just gets out there. It took us quite weeks and weeks to prepare, I mean, we had that celebrity look-alike thing, so we went on the Craigslist, of course, we went to all the celebrity look-alike places, and got it in the show business and backstage, so as we started a long search for look-alikes, some were, were very elusive, you know, but others walked in and they were perfect, you know, and some with the hair and makeup it became even better, you know. Um, I ended up getting the actual, the referee, the son of the actual referee from the fight. He weighs 205 and one half pounds, undefeated at 20. I just knew that Arthur Mercanti was the actual referee and that his son, who is now the age that his dad was during the fight, and he resembles him, that worked out perfectly. And um, yeah, and got real corner men, you know, go to the boxing arenas and get, you know, Gleason's and all the different gyms around Manhattan and New York to find corner men and referees and counters and timers and everybody that looks like they know what they're doing and try to get the real thing, of course, you know. We try to make it as proper as we can through wardrobe and props and us and hair and makeup and big one. It was a big scene. He also knew to not really shoot the fight in close-up because that would only be disappointing. But he did shoot a Lee Frazier look-alikes, but he shoots them in a way that emotionally gets you there because you really get a sense that they are those two actors. 
uh, but he shoots it in a way that doesn't um, in any way fractionalize their, uh, our, us believing it's them, because he doesn't shoot a lot of the fight. Here we go, here we go, here we go. We're here in Madison Square Garden, 1971. It's gonna be on, cause we don't get along. That's right, Frazier. I'm coming for you. Tell your mama I'm coming for you. I'm playing Joe Frazier, one of the best boxers of all times. It's totally an honor. And he fought Muhammad Ali three times, and this time I get to beat Muhammad Ali as Joe Frazier. What's important about that Ali Frazier fight is that Frank Lucas, who was throughout the whole movie, was so down low, no one knew who he was. Almost, he almost was an infamous crime figure. And when he gets to this fight, having been convinced by his girlfriend that he should wear a chinchilla coat and a chinchilla hat to show that he's a big man, he's, he's Frank Lucas, you do see the power of Frank Lucas as he enters that stadium, and that's what Ridley captures. That's good, great, very good. Okay. And then we hit the fighters coming in, okay? Sit down, sit down, sit down. Okay, not bad. I'd love to make it a little quicker if I could. That's very nice. That's where the fighters would come on, see? Okay, cut it. Frank Lucas gets to the fight, with his girlfriend, with his chinchilla hat and coat. Everybody recognizes him, and it's at that moment that the cops also recognize this is the guy. It's got to be the guy, because how does Frank Sinatra, how does the Italian Mafia, how does Joe Lewis know this man? Background action. That was cool, that was good, you know, nice coat. <laughs> I got to wear, he, he actually told me how that story really happened. Everybody's there, pimps and everybody, but drug dealers, now it's their chance to be a star. He's walking in this big chinchilla coat, and he, you know, they want to pound their chest and, and make noise too. When Frank first turned up, um, then he would come once a week. I would say by the halfway in, he was there every day. How y'all doing? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so and then he had his family there with him all day. He once shared with me and he said, he told me what to do. I said, oh, oh, give him a space over here. When they show up, well, Ridley's so good at handling everybody. You know, uh, they would have been intrusive if had Ridley allowed them to be. But he's, he's Teflon, you know? I mean, he, he says hello, but doesn't go much further than that. Because if he says, hello, how are you, he knows that's going to start a question and an opinion from either Richie Roberts or Frank Lucas. And he doesn't need any more opinions. He's done his research, and he's a master filmmaker. He doesn't need to hear more about from Frank Lucas what it was like. He now knows what it's like. He's ready to shoot it. 